Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and it's a Friday, so it's time for a Gross Path Challenge. As I do at the beginning of all my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me images, either directly or through online collections that I have listed here, which allow me to put these quizzes together. Thank you all for supporting veterinary pathology education. Okay, it's time to get our pens, papers, and pencils out. And image one is from a dog. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, hopefully you pause for about 60 seconds to write down gallbladder mucosile. These are occasionally seen in the dog. They are generally painful. They're very tight and they can occasionally rupture, resulting in severe peritonitis. I personally think that they're a bit of a spectrum between traditional cystic mucinous hyperplasia and this severe lesion, which fills the lumen of the gallbladder. On radiographs, they give a characteristic kiwi fruit sign to radiologists and resemble, if you've cut into a kiwi fruit, the inside of that particular fruit. This particular finding has been associated with certain breeds, including Shetland sheepdogs, and the literature um, initially reported that this was associated with a, a mutation of the ABCB4 gene, but a follow-up study shows that this association is not strong and probably not true, so I think uh, the book is still open on the mutation associated with this particular lesion in the dog. Okay, let's move on. Slide number two is from a lizard. I would like a morphologic diagnosis on this slide as well. Okay, time's up. This is focally extensive articular urate deposition. And just to make sure that the grader knows I know what I'm talking about, I'm going to put in parentheses articular gout. Gout is not an uncommon finding in uh, reptiles and birds. In chicken, it's often seen at a very low grade um, in most uh, production facilities as a result of dehydration. And the same can be said in uh, reptiles if uh, uh, it is seen over the viscera. Uh, often diet uh, has a due to the levels of protein may have something to do with, uh, with gout too. The, the pathogenesis of articular gout is not as well defined as the more generalized forms of gout. But you can see it in uh, just about any joint, in just about uh, any particular reptile. So articular gout. Slide number three is an excellent, excellent picture from Dr. Donald O'Toole. This is tissue from an ox. I'd like for you to give me the morphologic diagnosis and the cause. Okay, time's up. We're looking at a section of a liver. The liver's a little fatty, um, and if you wrote down hepatic lipidosis, give yourself a point, but I'm not going to give you full credit because obviously there's something else going here, and we have these large, very blanched areas of coagulative necrosis, multifocal coalescing, coagulative necrosis. If you said multifocal coalescing, necrotizing hepatitis, that is the diagnosis I prefer, but hepatic necrosis would be just fine. This is a very classic lesion, which is associated with Fusobacterium necrophorum. Fusobacterium necrophorum is a bacteria that has some very potent exotoxins and results in large areas of necrosis throughout which you will see the agent. Chances are it showed up in the liver after getting into the portal circulation from a possibly subclinical or a clinical case of ruminal acidosis. It's a normal commensal in the respiratory and GI tracts. It's a survivor and will survive a drastic drop in the pH of the rumen. 
Nothing else really looks like this. Well demarcated areas of coagulative necrosis. There's no elevation of the capsule to suggest that a lot of inflammatory cells have been added. It's no abscess. And uh, just a very classic lesion in ruminants of Fusobacterium necrophorum. Ready to go on? Ah, oh, this is a, a great slide from Dr. Trent Bollinger. And we're looking at a weasel. This is tissue from a weasel. I think it might be a least weasel, but it's a weasel nonetheless. A weasels are mustelids. And I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up on this one. Oh, this is a classic lesion. Uh, mustelids are exquisitely sensitive to canine morbillivirus, virus, the same morbillivirus virus that causes canine distemper. Um, obviously, it will affect canids. It also affects uh, large cats, um, especially in zoos, and related morbillivirus viruses will affect a wide range of species, including uh, dolphins and, and seals. Um, but uh, mustelids are very susceptible to this particular condition. The morphologic diagnosis is based on the lesion of crusting around the eyes, around the nose, around the lips, and on the ears, and this is a multifocal to coalescing hyperkeratotic facial dermatitis, classic hard pad disease. And there's really no difference in the pathogenesis of distemper in mustelids than there is in dogs. So if you know about the dog disease, you know all about the, the lesion in, uh, in mustelids, although they tend to die a little faster. Okay, slide number five. Oh, it's another great lesion. This is tissue from an ox. I'd like a morphologic diagnosis and four possible causes. And there are a lot more than that, So, but I just want you to give me four of them. Okay, time's up. Absolutely beautiful picture. I'm betting this one is from uh, South America. The morphologic diagnosis is multifocal to coalescing aortic and got to look closely same things going on in the myocardium and myocardial subendocardial mineralization so all of this is mineralized it wrinkles up i bet this animal see some more down here you can see it on the valve leaflet i bet this animal had severe mineralization in a lot of other organs the mineralization that we see is often reflective of a systemic problem and there are a number of conditions which will cause this form of calcification. Uh, plants that contain vitamin D analogs. So these are, are things that resemble vitamin D. Vitamin D opens the floodgates to calcium in the intestine. So these go in and, and uh, hit the calcium, the vitamin D receptors on enterocytes and, and allows them to be permeable to calcium. So the animal's body is flooded with calcium. These plants uh, Tracetum flavescum, Cestrum diurnum, and Solanum malacoxylon, or other species of those genera of plants are all acceptable. That's three really good ones. Um, alfalfa has been known to be very high in calcium, um, but it's such a widely used feedstuff. I have trouble believing that uh, it's really going to cause this that often. There are a couple of, of disease processes that will cause uh, mineralization. And they all have to do, a lot of them have to do with granulomas inflammation. Um, Mycobacterium avium variant tuber paratuberculosis or Yoni's disease may have uh, endocardial mineralization and hypercalcemia as findings. And hypercalcemia is often associated with malignant lymphoma in cattle. So I would accept malignant lymphoma. So if you gave me, uh, if you gave me three plants and maybe one of the other two perfectly acceptable. Uh, if you're thinking about vitamin D uh, intoxication, that's a bit of a tough one. You can see that more in monogastrics than you can. Now you give as much vitamin D as you want to a cow. It's probably going to be bound up in the rumen. Um, I'm not going to give credit for that one, but it's a nice thought. Uh, as I said before, animals with these type of plant intoxications, this is often the last and final straw 
that you will see. They often start with a, sort of a very stiff and stilted gait with mineralization of the skeletal muscles in the intercostal spaces. And on the front limbs, you will see mineralization in a number of other uh, spots, including the kidney, maybe in the lung. And the heart is usually the last nail in the coffin for more of these animals. Okay, here's an oldie, but a goodie. And this is slide number six. This is tissue from a nude mouse. I guess I didn't have to tell you that because there's not a lot of hair on this. Okay, so it's from a, a nude mouse. Oh, I gotta tell you what I want. I want the morphologic diagnosis and the cause of this lesion. Okay, time's up. Um, when we talk about nude mice, it's more than just the, uh, the follicular dysplasia and the hair shafts, um, which break off as the hair uh, comes out of the follicle that uh, makes for a nude mouse. Nude mouse are also uh, severely immunodeficient. Not totally, but generally severely. So they're open and they develop um, more severe disease or chronic infections in less pathogenic agents, agents than uh, um, other, other mice, wild-type mice. So one of the classic scourges of nude mice, especially uh, when they were in the first stages of development, um, is mouse coronavirus. Um, there are two different types of mouse coronaviruses. There is a enterotropic version, which pretty much just hits the gut, which can result in some uh, uh, diarrhea, some syncytia. Um, but there's also one known as the polytropic murine coronavirus, which also goes by the name of mouse hepatitis virus. It causes lesions in a number of organs. It's named for the severe necrosis, which it causes in the liver, especially in immunodeficient mice. So the morphologic diagnosis is going to be multifocal to coalescing hepatic necrosis or necrotizing hepatitis. Either is fine. I was taught that if you, there's an agent, if you can see an actual bacteria or virus, you call it necrotizing hepatitis. If you can't, if it's a toxic lesion, you call it hepatic necrosis. But I give full credit for either one. And the cause is the polytropic murine coronavirus. Uh, this, like the other, uh, like the enterotropic coronavirus, is going to cause some really beautiful syncytia within hepatocytes, but oftentimes there's so much necrosis, these syncytia are necrotic as well. It's a very characteristic histologic appearance to the liver, and, uh, and I think that's the best answer to this question. Could it be something else? Could it be bacterial disease like, like Clostridios, Clostridioides piliformi? I would give full credit for something like that as well, which can cause pretty significant necrosis. But nude mouse, hepatic necrosis, I'm putting mouse hepatitis virus at the top of my list. On to the next slide. This is tissue from a dog. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and two associated clinical pathologic abnormalities. When I say clinical pathologic abnormalities, let's shorten that. Let's say abnormalities in the ClinPath data. So don't give me vomiting. Okay, time's up. We're looking at a bisected adrenal with a nice hole in the middle, like somebody put it on a mar in a toothpick to put it in a martini. Um, perhaps this animal had an adrenal cortical biopsy. Not exactly sure why there's a hole in the middle of that. Um, but when you cut a when you bisect the adrenal longitudinally, not transversely, but you go the long way, and you look at the cortex, the medulla, and the opposite cortex, it should be about one to one to one. That's pretty easy to remember. This one's obviously one to five to one, maybe even higher. So the morphologic diagnosis for this particular case would be a diffuse adrenocortical atrophy. There are a number of causes that, of adrenal cortical atrophy, but, but the most likely cause is the iatrogenic administration of corticosteroids, a classic cause that causes Addisonian crises. You may have, in the contralateral adrenal, which we're not looking at, you may have a cortisol-secreting tumor. 
So you would get atrophy of the cortex uh, of that particular gland and the other gland. So that's another possibility here. Um, maybe perhaps this animal had adrenocortical, this hyperadrenocorticism as a result of a pituitary tumor, and it was treated with one of the uh, number of drugs that are used to treat that. Um, so there's a possible, and there are forms of inflammatory adrenalitis like lymphocytic adrenalitis in standard poodles that will do this. But I didn't ask you for causes. I asked you for morphologic diagnosis and two associated clin path abnormalities. And the ones that I think about when I think about uh, Addisonian disease, hypoadrenal dogs, be the ones that are associated both sodium and potassium. The sodium drops, the potassium is elevated. Um, so hyponatremia and hyperkalemia would be my top two. Uh, these animals are often azotemic as well, but uh, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia. Okay, normally if the, and this number's all over the place. If you take the sodium, you divide up the number for sodium, you divide it by the number for uh, uh, potassium, and it's less than, some people say 27, some people say 25, some people say 23, but somewhere in that range. If it's le certainly less than that, I would be thinking about an Addisonian crisis. Okay. Next slide is tissue from an ox. I'd like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up for this one. It's a classic lesion. Everybody should know this one. Uh, some of you might have said, oh, I know this lesion. And then you're like, oh my gosh, what is the name of the bacteria? Sometimes the easiest ones can be a little tricky. Um, this one is very straightforward. It's a multifocal coalescing. Necrohemorrhagic skeletal myositis with emphysema. And these little highlights in the picture are all little gas bubbles. The agent that has produced this is Clostridium chauvii. This is, the name of the disease is black leg. Cattle are not, uh, they're not sterile critters. Uh, they pre-position a lot of clostridial agents throughout their body. They, they put Clostridium chauvii in their muscles in a sort of a dormant form, waiting just for uh, uh, the uh, muscle to get hit in the right spot to get a hematoma and areas of ischemia where they can begin to proliferate. So, a little bit of ischemia, you have proliferation of these, and then the exotoxins cause a tremendous amount of damage. Um, the, the, the cow has lots of clostridia. You've got clostridia hemolyticum prepositioned in the liver, you got. Clostridium novii, pre-positioned in the liver, just waiting for some ischemia. You can also see lesions associated with black leg in other uh, organs, including the heart. Um, you can't, you know, give an injection in the heart or hit the cow in the butt with a or shovel and, and get black leg in the heart. And so that pathogenesis is a little cloudier. Perhaps it's due to stress, um, which will cause some ischemia in the heart due to, or, or a brain lesion due to brain heart syndrome. And, you, and in young animals, you can often see it in the tongue um, or in the muscles of deglutition or swallowing. Because those are, even in some older animals, they're constantly chewing and, and chewing their cud and all that. So those are muscles that uh, tend to get a good workout and may get bouts of ischemia. But any skeletal muscle is subject to the development of black leg during uh, bouts of ischemia. Okay, let's move on. This is a classic picture from a guinea pig. I'd like you to give me a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and another site where a similar lesion may be found. Okay, time's up. This one's a little tricky. It's a cross-section, and it's a cross-section through the heart, the mediastinum, and both lungs. One lung is somewhat compressed and atelectatic. One lung is obviously pneumonic. And then everything is covered, including the pericardials, the epicardial surface, and the pleura by a very thick layer of 
fibrin. Whenever you see this much fibrin, regardless of what animal species, I always caution people to think just for a moment, could this be strep? Because strep will give you some of the best fibrinous exudates ever. In guinea pigs, strep pneumoniae is a classic pathogen. It's spread by human handlers. We all have strep pneumoniae in our res upper respiratory tract, and when it gets cold out, um, we tend to shed it. And certain species that are worked with in lab animal colonies, including primates and guinea pigs, are very susceptible to it. And you get just classic. This would be a, a diffuse fibrinosuppurative pleuropneumonia and epicarditis. Okay, obviously we've got a pneumonic lung. Um, being strep, it would cause a, a fibrinosuppurative lesion. And definitely I want to make it pleural pneumonia because of the tremendous amounts of fibrin on the pleural surface. And another organ that would likely have a lesion, well, you're going to have this outpouring of fibrin into all of your potential spaces. We're looking at the pericardial space, we're looking at the pleural space, and we have a couple more that we want to examine. One would be the abdomen or the peritoneum, one would be the meninges, and one would be the joint. So I would look for a fibrinous meningitis or fibrinous arthritis or peritonitis in this animal as well. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Okay, last slide, slide number 10. This is tissue from an ox. How about a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. We're looking at the ab abomasum, and there is a tremendous proliferative abomasitis. If you want to call this abomasal epithelial hypertrophy and hyperplasia, that would be fine. But the mucosa is greatly hyperplastic due to the presence of Ostertagia ostertagii, a trichostrongyle. We're a little too far out to see the little tiny red worms which lay on the surface of the mucosa and through just chronic irritation will cause a tremendous proliferation of the mucous neck cells within the, uh, within the mucosa. You may see some clinical pathologic abnormalities associated with this um, because the tremendous hyperplasia and the, the way this mucosa is remodeled and thrown together makes for a very leaky, leaky mucosa. And these animals are hypoproteinemic. They may be um, hormones that are secreted may uh, um, may actually be in be get into the bloodstream that way. So they might be hypergastrinemic. Um, the gastrin is more because they're trying to uh, lower the pH. Uh, when you get this tremendous proliferation of mucous neck cells, it tends to crowd out the parietal cells which produce acid. So uh, um, they have to produce a lot of gastrin. Um, you might get a hyperpepsinogenemia because the mucosa is leaky and that pepsinogen is going to leak from the gastric or the abomasal lumen into the blood vessels. So those are very characteristic. And then anytime you get remodeling of the mucosal surface in the GI tract, it's often accompanied with protein loss and hypoproteinemia. There's not a lot of inflammation associated with these worms. When you biopsy this, you, you probably see none at all because they don't really, they don't anchor, they don't embed anything. So the body doesn't really know they're there. They're still in the environment, but they do cause this tremendous mucosal hyperplasia. Okay, well that's it for today. I hope uh, everyone uh, made 110%. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed this uh, little show, and I also hope everyone has a great weekend. We'll see you next Friday for another Gross Path Challenge.